feeling lost and alone, looking for validation from your partner only to find the feeling of rejection and continued frustration, you're together yet so far apart. Now your frustration has turned into disdain and resentment. Your insecurities have begun to affect every aspect of your life. Ironically, you have now become the cold and detached one, shielding yourself from the uncertainties of your relationships. Dr. April Brown has created Bringing Intimacy Back, a series of discussions that are designed to help you reclaim what you have lost along the way. Dr. April will help you rediscover and reconnect to the intimate relationship your heart so desires. Go to www.bringingintimacyback.com today and let the healing begin. Welcome to the Bringing Intimacy Back show, where intimacy is real. On this show, we aim to help you increase the intimate connection between you, your significant other, your higher power, family, friends, business, networks. We just help you connect. We give you the secret power to intimacy to create a life you love or love the life you create. And so on today's show, today we always talk about intimacy. And today we want to talk about intimacy, but also with intimacy and a group of people or uh, any of us, this can happen to any of us, who may have a chronic illness. Because sometimes if you're sick or you have an illness and stuff, sometimes things people forget about you, feel life forgets about you and things are difficult. And so today what we want to talk about is to give you resources, ideas, share thoughts, and also to even open up um, everyone's perspective on this topic. And so today I have, of course, um, a great expert, okay? His name is Dr. Melvin Lee Phillips. And Dr. Melvin Lee Phillips is actually in our capital in DC. And he treats chronic illnesses and sexual dysfunction. Welcome, Dr. Michael Lee, um, I'm sorry, Melvin Lee Phillips, how are you doing? I'm great. Thank you for having me. Yes, 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 yes. Well, we're so excited to um, have you on the show and to talk about intimacy. And you go by um, Dr. Lee Phillips? Yeah, I go by yes. Lee. Yeah, Dr. Yes. Lee, Dr. Lee Phillips. Yep, that's fine. <laughs> okay. Yes. So, um, Dr. Lee, how did you even get into the field of um, therapy and then, or counseling or whatever? And then how did you decide to focus on chronic illness and intimacy? Well, I ended up, you know, uh, leaving college in New York City and I moved back to um, Chesapeake, Virginia, and I pursued an uh, undergraduate degree in communications because I was not sure what I really wanted to do. And mm -hmm. then I started to research social work and counseling, and I decided to go into social work, it being a very broad field. I didn't know if I wanted to do policy work or mental health. And so as I started to get into my program, I started to really fall in love with psychotherapy and really um, focusing on co-occurring disorders at the time, working with folks that had you know, a mental health issue and also a substance use problem. And so that kind of got me into psychotherapy. Um, which I worked in community mental health for about 10 years. And then I moved to DC and pursued my career as an administrator and, you know, came to find that I really, it wasn't very fulfilling and I really wanted to get back into psychotherapy. So I went into private practice full time. So that's where I'm at now. Awesome. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. And so then why decide on chronic illness? Well, it's interesting because when I worked in community mental health, I worked as a geriatric psychotherapist. Okay. And so I had several different clients um, coming in with various uh, medical conditions that caused quite a bit of you know, depression, anxiety, and other mental health issues of concern. And that kind of sparked my interest in it more. But then I started seeing younger people that were coming in. I was starting to get known in the community. And so I had young folks coming in that had autoimmune diseases and other neurological disorders that really um, had a lot of psychological effects due to their chronic illness and caused a lot of chronic pain due to their chronic illness. And so that really got me more into the work. And I wanted to carry that on here when I came to DC. Okay. Yeah. So what do you really define as um, chronic illness? Well, you know, chronic, 
Yeah, chronic illness is defined mainly is broadly as conditions that last about a year or more, and they require okay. like ongoing medical attention or limited activities of daily daily living or both. And you know what's interesting is that. Um, what we're finding in the research, according to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, chronic diseases, they affect about 133 million Americans, and that's wow. about 40% of the population. Really? really? Yes. And by 2020, 40%. Num- yeah, and by 2020, that number is it's going to be estimated to about, well, this year, 2020, um, a fi- 157 million with about 81 million having multiple conditions. Mm. And, and so what we're finding is, is that people are having a lot of, um, you know, sexual dysfunction due to that. And the reason why I got into sex therapy too, was because I went to a building your private practice workshop here in DC and, and the woman that hosted that workshop, who's now one of my mentors, she asked me, she said, have you ever thought about becoming a sex therapist? Because people with disabilities and chronic illness, they want to reclaim their intimacy and their sexuality. So I thought that was fascinating. So that's how I got involved in sex and chronic illness. Wow. Yes, yes. And I'm just thinking that she was telling me the definition. And it's, you know, an illness for over a year or so. And many times it does affect your life. Yes. You know? In so many yes. different ways. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. yes. And so um, with that, many times that comes with, um, how can I put it? Just depression and stuff because you can't deal with your used to doing it maybe um i'm glad we we're talking about intimacy because people may be like oh my gosh you're you're sick and it's hands off and you just don't have um don't want people with that type of illness to have be hopeless you know right absolutely you bring so much hope into this yeah so that's the whole goal is to be able to reclaim something just because you know not having it destroy your life just because you have a chronic illness because the whole goal is to learn how to accept it and live well with it, I think. I think that's right. what I really work on with individuals and couples when they come in to see me. And, you know, everyone's illness is going to be different. So, you know, everyone, every client, you know, as we know as therapists that come into treatment, they're going to be different. And so it's by an individual basis. And so people come in during many phases of a chronic illness. They may come in when they've just been diagnosed, They may be coming in where they're not sure what's going on and they're going from doctor to doctor to find out what it is. So there's a crisis state that happens. But I find that when an individual and a couple, they know the diagnosis, that's when they really want to start to become intimate again. They want to reclaim their sexuality. And I think that's such a big piece of what we do in sex therapy. Right, right, right. Why do you think intimacy is so important in a relationship? (sighs) Well, you know, I think intimacy, you know, it's such a broad word. And it yeah, can how do you mean, even define it? <laughs> it can mean so many like different things. But, you know, right. to me, um, an intimate relationship, it is that definitely that interpersonal relationship. And it involves a range of things, physical and emotional intimacy. And I think when we're in a partnership, we have various needs that want to be met, right? So we have our emotional needs and we have our physical needs. And so... The physical intimacy is characterized, you know, by romantic or passionate attachment or sexual activity. And that's such a big part of a relationship. And so when someone gets diagnosed with a chronic illness condition, that tends to go to the, to the wayside or it can for some couples. So, so that's, I think that's such a big part of a relationship. And, you know, when people come in to see a sex therapist, that's one reason why they're really coming in. They're trying to figure out what's going on with desire and arousal, what's going on with their attachment to each other, what's going on with the sexual communication. And so one of the things that I think is really important to talk about with couples is sexual empathy and starting to use that to reclaim their sexuality with a chronic illness. Okay. And, um, Yes, empathy is one of my favorite, favorite words. And so sexual empathy, which I haven't heard before, which is great. So can you define that first? Sexual empathy is where you come to a place with your partner and you look at what's possible instead of once was once achievable. And I think that's critical 
when you're working with a chronic illness um, or really just it, even if you're not, you know, you're looking at what's possible in your relationship. There is this having a high regard for each other. You're emotionally connected to me. Right. That is that core of sexual empathy that you're there for each other. And I think, and it's, you're not seeing the blame game going on. Right. That's when we have sexual empathy. Right. Awesome. Yes. And I'm thinking even with, um, illnesses and stuff many times and you said the blame game you i'm assuming you have to work with the individual not to blame themselves yes because there's a lot of shame that comes with an illness so yeah. yep we hear a lot of that i hear a lot of that and i hear several different messages in my office i hear everything from how do i juggle my needs of being ill and disabled how do i support the needs of my partner who is healthy how can I fight or cope with feelings of inadequacy and shame due to my illness? How do I keep it together for my partner who's battling a chronic illness? So for the partner that does not have a chronic illness, how can I be of support right. and still be a partner even though I'm, I'm being a caregiver too? Right, right. Because sometimes those roles get kind of, yeah. Yeah, they get better. switched. Yeah. yeah. They get switched, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and even when you're sick, how to even, like you say, feel a little sexy. Right. How to become sexy again. Yeah. And right. I think that is something to really work through. You know, what I find with couples when they come into therapy is that they really have to work on their emotional bonding or their emotional stability to get to a place where they can be sexual again. I have seen it on the other side of the fence where they really just need to reclaim their sexuality and the relationship can fix itself. But I've seen that to be very rare. I find that couples have this emotional disconnect. I call that the rupture in the relationship. And so I think what we have to do is work on healing that rupture. And that rupture can be to an illness. It can be to infidelity. If they're a couple that practices monogamy, it can be all different types of things that are going on. And, you know, and I know, as you know, there, you know, there's a lot of reasons for, um, you know, for, for low desire and arousal. And right. I think illness and medical reasons are one of those, they don't get talked about so much. Right, right, yeah. right. Yeah, and as you were saying about this rupture, you know, um, when it's um, infidelity, sometimes there's a, you know, a way to blame or whatever. But when it's a medical thing, it's really, sometimes there's nobody to blame, but you get upset. Yes. Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> There's no, there, but it, what's interesting is that, you know, that's, it's interesting that you bring that up because it's not a blame, but for some reason right. it goes into a blame game with the right. partners. It's like, well, we can't have sex anymore because you don't have the desire due to your rheumatoid arthritis. Right. So no, that right. damages me. How do you not feel, you know, upset about even saying that or feeling that? Exactly, yeah. exactly. And so, you know, the antidote of blame is accountability, right? It's like, well, you know, um, I'm accountable because yes, I, I did this and I'm working on that. But I think when we get hit with a chronic illness, we really, one thing that I do is try to hold a safe space where we can get to the point and say, well, you know what? No one is, is to blame here. This is something that's happened. And I try to get the couple to work as, you know, that team with each other to where they can reclaim things that they have lost. Right. But to also just look at what's possible, you know, maybe they won't be able to have the same type of intimacy that they had in the past, but get them to a place where they can do something that is enjoyable because, you know, sex is not about a performance. It's about right. pleasure. Like pleasure. Right. Right. And I love how you put it that it's about the accountability, you know, yes. as each person being accountable and having that, um, as you put it before, the sexual empathy for the partner. Absolutely. So being able to hold that safe space for them just to, you know, I find that that's one of the magical things about, you know, psychotherapy and sex therapy is just holding the space for people to process mm -hmm. and to listen. And so to hold that place where they don't have to feel shamed, they don't have to feel judged. Okay. And that, you know, because what it comes down to is that you can be sexy still. Right. You know, your sexiness is unique. It's different from everybody else's. And so, you know, one of the things I really try to do is help them define what is that to them? What does it mean to be sexy now? And how can you connect on a deeper level now that this has affected your life? Because 
when people can accept things, I feel like with an illness, um, the illness becomes one part of their life. Right. It can become one part of it. And yes, there are certain illnesses where we see relapses and flare ups. And so that's when we go into self care. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yes. Well, we're going to take a short break, but when we come back, we're going to talk more about how you help couples define what all this means to their sexual life and um, all the stuff that you've done um, in working with couples and giving some couples some tools. So we're going to take a short break and we'll be back in a few minutes. Are you wanting a vacation in paradise? A vacation to rekindle the passion? A vacation without the kids? A vacation where you can learn how to communicate, where you and your partner hear each other and gain insight? Vacation counseling is your next vacation. Stay in one of our exclusive villas for the ultimate couples retreat. Enjoy dining, boating, and all that South Florida has to offer. Let our counselors guide you through the rest. Vacation counseling, accepting applications for summer 2020. Visit www.vacationcounseling.com for more information. All right, well, welcome back. So, Dr. Phillips. Yes, I, we were just, you were just sharing with us um, how you help couples define what that means in the sense of couples who may one partner, or sometimes maybe even both partners have a chronic illness and how to move with them. How do you help couples define? Well, each couple, of course, is going to be very different. So um, couples who battle static or dynamic illnesses will definitely benefit from doing couple sex therapy. And what I mean by static illnesses, that may mean something like a paralysis, cerebral palsy, things that stay static. And with dynamic illnesses, that could be something like an autoimmune disease or a neurological disorder where we have relapses and flare-ups. And so I think it's seeing what, what type of disorder they have coming in, being able to define what does that mean to them and to see where they're at. One of the things that I do is that I always assess to see where they're at <clears throat> with coping with the chronic illness. So there's different phases of a chronic illness. So the first phase is the crisis phase, and that's characterized by crisis and chaos. And I have seen some couples that come in when they're in that phase. So I try to just give them a safe space, be supportive, to help them move from the actual onset of their illness to an emergency stage to help them get some sort of relief, to give them some resources, to get help for it, medical, spiritual, whatever that's going to be. And um, the ultimate goal is to just get immediate um, help in that stage. Okay. So I have some couples that come in and then I have some couples that come in and they're in a stabilization phase. So I help them understand that and that's when they reached a plateau of symptoms and because they stay more or less the same, they become familiar with the diagnosis. That's okay. the critical part. And so instead of it, if it's a couple, instead of being my illness, it's our illness. And mm. we're working as a team together. I think that's okay. critical. Um, and then of course, resolution, where they have a plateau of symptoms that are still there, but they're learning how their illness behaves and how the world responds to it. And okay. so helping them do that. And of course, the last phase is integration. So really helping them to arrive to a new place in their partnership where they're at. And one part of that is just recognizing that it's just one part of their life. Now, one technique that I love using that really does help is that I draw a lot out of Imago relationship therapy. So having them do some type of dialogue instead of a discussion, because when they're discussing things, they have room for reactivity. But if we're doing a dialogue and they're doing some mirroring work, validating and empathy in the session, then we see that there's less rupture of reactivity that could happen. Okay. And okay. that's very helpful. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. It seemed like that would be very successful and they can, like you said, model it in session and then work on it um, in private. Right. Yes. The goal is to give them some homework to take that home because the healthy partner or the partners that, that, that's not sick, they may not understand really what their partner's going through. So helping them get to a place where they can have some type of validation. And, you know, with validation, 
it's not necessarily agreeing with your partner. It's just acknowledging their feelings. Mm -hmm. Yes. Acknowledgement is acknowledgement and acceptance is key. Absolutely. <laughs> That's something that I always strive for in my sessions and getting there, you know, every, every individual and couple's different, but it's always nice when they can finally get to that place. Cause I think that's where we start to see the healing. Right. Right. Cause I'm, I'm assuming that many people get stuck about how things were in the past and how their life was. And you know, yes. Like I was healthy. I could do yes, this. Could I do could, yeah. I could have this type of sex or we could take yeah. vacations and now things have changed. Right. right, right. And helping them to um, not just see in the black and white, but there's many different shades of, of this yes exactly different possibilities that they can engage in yes yes so with the person that's um with the illness do you um sometimes work with them separately or you always just do um couples work because each um, other coming from two different right i have spectrum. i have worked with them individually before and then they will bring their partner in every once in a while for couples work and sometimes just to help the other partner that's that does not have a chronic illness is to also refer them to someone that they can speak with about their own stress right. if they're experiencing some type of you know um caregiving stress yeah. uh they may have depression and anxiety themselves a high level of a stress level now and gaining some coping skills on how they can decrease quite a bit of their stress i think that's important um okay. and giving them the resources that they need. Sometimes there's right. there's amazing like caregiver support groups that people can right, go to. Of course, to. definitely different um, things. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'm I'm glad we're talking about this because also I think sometimes when you're struck with a chronic illness such as cancer or a variety of different things, um, people think that I shouldn't even think about my intimate life or my intimacy or sex, and I cannot talk to my doctors and you know. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. I have, yes, that's great that you bring that up because I have several clients that come in, you know, for, for psychotherapy and sex therapy. And they're like, I'm so glad that you specialize in this, Dr. Phillips, because I can't talk to my doctor about right. this. And, right. you know, I was never told that I was going to have low desire and arousal or some other type of sexual dysfunction. Mm -hmm. um, that's why I love it when we can find doctors in the community that also work with sex therapists. I think that's right. amazing. Right, right, right. And if you're having a chronic illness and stuff, you should ask your doctor about it, and especially the medications and all that. How yeah. is this going to affect? Yes. Because like you said, many times they don't know. Right. They don't, they don't know. So having them, you know, I think one of the best things that we can do as psychotherapist, sex therapist is really, again, it's holding that space and just listening because I think there's a grief process that the couple goes through. And you know, with grief, it's not linear. It goes in so many different types of directions. Yes. And so being able to, to help them work through those stages, whether they go through denial, mm -hmm. whether they're in anger, um, right. They may be in depression and then getting them to a place of acceptance. I mean, I've had couples where they get to acceptance, but then they fall back again. Something triggers <laughs> yeah. them to where they fall back because they can't do maybe some, maybe a sexual activity that they loved mm -hmm. they do it, or there's lack of desire or arousal there. So oh. there's many of things that you can, you can really help them with. Oh, good, good. And so with, do you also help, because many, some illnesses have pain. Yes. Yes. Most of your, a lot of your illnesses do. Like the one that I see most of is fibromyalgia, right. which of right. course today is such a big mystery. You know, many mm -hmm. people, it's kind of like the slap on the, it's the slap on illness where we don't know what it is. So we're, we're going to say it. fibromyalgia. And with fibromyalgia, there's pain that can radiate through the whole body, which causes intense depression and anxiety. So of course, when there's pain, there's a lack of desire. Right. And so we talk about an action plan on wellness. And I think another thing that's really important to bring up is energy level. So oh, say yes. you yes, were more intimate in the evening, but with an illness now, um, you have more energy in the morning. Right. So that may be the time to have some type of sexual activity or to be intimate with mm -hmm. your partner. So we mm -hmm. have to kind of dig deep and find out, well, what can we do now since everything has changed? 
Right, definitely. That, what I call that too, that's basically sexual adjustment. Yes. You know, yes. so. And from the partner's perspective, um, many times when someone, I mean, I've seen it in my own counseling sessions, when someone has pain and as a partner, you're a little fearful. Like, I don't want to touch and just want, you know what I'm saying? I don't want to cause yes. more. Yes, yes. I don't want and, to hurt and, you. I don't want to injure right. you. Right, yeah. right, so right. And I've seen partners, um, you know, involve themselves in sex or whatever, and then they're very painful and it just becomes, yeah. Yeah. So, so what we do with that is one of the things that I talk about with the partner that has a disability is what is your blueprint of your sensations? Like it's mm. kind of them going into a place where they lay out a blueprint of their body and where they feel the sensations that they like, right? And what is it, what is it that they don't like and what's uncomfortable? So this is where sexual communication really comes in. I like it when you touch me like this, you know, it's uncomfortable when you touch me here. It's almost like doing, it's almost like doing sensate focus, right? It's kind of right, like of course. mindfulness yes. of mindfulness of sex. It's being yes. mindful, touching what you can do. I think sometimes couples really go into sexual activity thinking that they have to perform and they have to have an orgasm. Right. And yeah. so we really work on trying to change. Um, yes. The perspective of that. Mm -hmm. And that it's about pleasure. Yeah, absolutely. And what do you both like? You know, some people find just simple touching, kissing, right. cuddling. That's enough, you know? Right. So we talk a lot about that. Kind of get them to a place where they can try new things. Okay, good, good. I really like how you put it, um, the blueprint. Yes. Yeah, like laying <laughs> out the blueprint of pleasure. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and it's great that you are uh, mentioning it. It's about communicating. Yes. It is. It, it, that's, you know, sex at its heart, it's about communication. It's about right. what do I find pleasurable? What do you find pleasurable? Is this something that we can try differently? Right. You know, what's also interesting too is that I've had couples that come in and the partner that has, you know, a chronic pain condition due to an illness or just an illness, they do not feel sexual at all. I've helped couples open their relationships up. That's another mm -hmm. thing. They start talking about consensual non-monogamy. We've, we've, yeah. we've talked about, I've helped couples go into polyamorous relationships. That's happened. Um, that's ultimately, you know, their decision. And I help right. work with them if that's what the direction they want to go into. And I've had a few right. clients where I've done that. Okay. Yeah. So you're just giving them all different possibilities of how they can um, each satisfy each other, but how, find satisfaction in other aspects um, through open communication and that kind yes, of stuff. Yes, yes, absolutely. Good. Yes. So we've been talking a lot about couples, but I know some of our listeners are probably single. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. And I've seen it where like you're um, young and you've um, got a chronic illness and then you're like, well, that's the end of my dating world. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I've had a few clients that come in that are single yes. and- they lose hope. Um, they're on the apps. They're on the yeah. apps, which there are so many these days. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and they're out there trying to find someone. And so really, um, you know, I think, again, I kind of assess where they're at in the phases stage. Okay. And then, you know, because sometimes they may come in and they're not even thinking about dating. Right, of course. And they get to a place where they're coping with it. They've accepted their illness or their disability. And they're like, hey, I want to be sexual. I, right. I want to meet someone. And so we talk about, well, what is it that you want in a relationship? Right. You know, what are you looking for? What are your expectations? And we go through those. Um, and then, of course, they talk about, well, you know, Dr. Phillips, what if I go out on a date? Right. Do what I is, tell them on the first date yes. that I'm chronically ill? Do I you know, and that's their decision. And so we talk about the benefits of doing that and how you're putting it out there if you really like the person or do okay. you not talk about it? Um, I also have them so go- So you think you should talk about it on the first date? Well, I think it really, I think it, de I think it really depends on the individual. Some people want to get okay. it out in the open because they're so anxious about it. Right. And then some people are like, well, maybe I should wait and see how this develops because that's another part that comes is right. waiting to see if something right. even invo invo evolves from it, right? Right, right, right. But because the rejection 
Yes, right. So if you get close to someone and you start dating them and then you tell them that, hey, I'm chronically ill and then they reject you, right? that's so hurtful. So some people would rather say something right in the beginning. Okay. 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 Right. And that makes, and that makes a lot of sense um, of just being completely authentic and stuff. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Being authentic with yourself and having self-compassion mm-hmm. for yourself. And I think that you know, building the self-esteem up. Because I think when you get to a place where you've accepted things where they're at, you're learning how to live well with chronic pain and chronic illness, you kind of get to a place where you may prepare yourself for that rejection. Okay. And so I think one thing to do too is like refer them to like, maybe there's a, wow, I haven't thought about this. Maybe there's like a singles chronically ill support group, right? Right, that right. Can go to where they can meet somebody else. That's another... Um, thing to definitely navigate as well. Right. Definitely. Good. Good. And so then on the other end, if you're meeting someone and you're just meeting them and you find out they have a chronic illness. Yeah. Yeah, If if you're the person on the other side of the fence. Yes. On the other side of the fence. Yeah. 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 Well, I think you have to look at your own expectations and what it is that you want in a partner and maybe do your research on it. right? Right. I think I think people don't understand chronic illness. I think that when, I think there are some, not all, but some people that when they go out on a date and the person says, oh, by the way, I've got, I've got multiple sclerosis. Right. Oh, well, then that must mean you're going to die on me. That's not the case. You know, a chronic illness is not a death sentence. Exactly. It's, it's treatable. And I think if people can do their research and find out that there is hope and look at the person for their other qualities, Mm-hmm. Look for yeah. the other things that they have, you know, their, their fun spirit, their energy that they have, their love for life, you know, they may meet some of the goals that they have. Right. You know, right. couples, when people are meeting each other, they are looking for some commonality. <laughs> yes. Would you suggest if you had a chronic illness to, and you disclose it to, to a person that you bring them some research on it or something? Yeah, I mean, yeah, take it to the restaurant. On a, take it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, yeah, yeah. Have the pamphlet. Have the pamphlet on them, and then give it to them at the date. Now, I mean, you know, I, I think. Well, here's my thing. If the date goes well, and there yes. is chemistry, and there's a connection, right? Then, as you disclose it, the other person may say, "Hey, yeah, give me some information on it. Let me okay. let me learn about it." And I've had couples in therapy where that's how they started. They really, okay. yeah, they knew that the person was chronically ill, but they did their research and, you know, um, they've been able to live a great life and maybe they're in here seeing me for other reasons. We also have to point out that sometimes sexual intimacy can be so powerful when a life has been constricted by chronic illness. Yes, yes. Tell me about that. I, I, yes, yes. I have my imagination going. Yeah. I mean, people come, you know, it, I think it's getting them to a place where it's like, wow, you know, I can have sex right. and have pleasure and that's completely distracting me from my pain right now. Right. Exactly. That's amazing. Mm-hmm. I, I love that. And, right. and then it know, can also um, relax your body. It can relax your body. Yeah, and a lot and of couples yep, yes. talk about that. Or I help give them some techniques to try different things with the touching. You know, a lot of my, my clients with chronic pain, they will, they will get into solo sex or masturbation and they say that it helps relieve pain. Pain, yes. And it, yes. And it helps relieve anxiety and they right, really right. enjoy it. So I think we have to look at that other side of the fence too. Of that, course. You know, just because your life is constricted by an illness or a disability, you can still find the things that make you sexy. You can mm-hmm. find new uh, variety of things in bed with your partner. I mean, that's why we have amazing toys. We have yes. different things to have fun with. Right, definitely. Yes, and I'm glad you, you mentioned that because like I said, it'll relax the body, which will, of course, your muscles are relaxed. Yes, yes. things can flow better and um, yes. for some of these illnesses, yes. Yeah, because what happens is with chronic body. pain, your body right. tenses up, you know, your body right tenses up. So when you know when you're having pleasure and there's arousal and, you know, say you have an orgasm, you go into a relaxation phase with your body and it feels good. So we talk about that in therapy with individuals and couples. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So um, you've got all this expert knowledge and you've written a book. 
I am in the process of I am in the process of writing uh, my first book. It's in the okay. uh, book proposal stages at this time. So okay. I've been on various shows promoting it and speaking at conferences, and I'm I'm really excited about it. It's called Sex and Love When You're Sick, okay. and it's going it's geared towards couples. But I think the people that are single they would also benefit from it because there's going to be um, it's going to help people overcome shame and sexual limitations caused by illness and give strategies to create and reclaim a sex life that works for them. Right. And the great thing is, is that it's going to be geared for all people. So there are going to be stories in the book that are with heterosexual clients, gay, lesbian, non-binary okay. clients who are polyamorous to be able to kinky clients, clients that are into BDSM, um, that type of thing to give them a way to become sexual again, because people, a lot of times they start to feel less attractive. They feel less confident and they're concerned how their body's going to work and adapts to an illness. And so giving them some strategies on how to do that, which I'm really, really excited about. I think it's going to benefit so many people. Yes. Is this the first kind of book out there like this? That I well, yeah. There's a great book out there, The Ultimate Guide um, for Sex, for Chronic Illness, Pain, and Disability, which I believe was written in 2007. It's an excellent book. So I really just want to add more to- Updated information, yes. Yeah, updated and kind of get out of the heteronormative type of thing with it and okay. have a book for like all people um, with many different genders and lifestyles and sexual right. orientation. And so- the goal behind the book is really going to help improve emotional connection around sexual intimacy to promote it. And so the goal is for people to learn their sexual awareness, how okay. to be aware in their body with an illness, how to communicate with their partner and learning their sexual style. Because what we find is say someone with an illness prior to their illness, they were very dominant. Right. They liked being a dom. They enjoyed that. And then all of a sudden, they're ill and they can't do that anymore. So it's talking about, well, what can my sexual style be now? Yeah. Okay. Okay. And I know we've been mostly talking about um, couples who are in the same household and stuff, but now with technology and stuff, and um, there's so much technology now to help, even if someone has a chronic illness and maybe their partner is in another state. Yes. Yes. Yeah. There's so there's, many different toys of virtual reality or, or even yeah, if you said if you are a dom and you can do something in virtual reality. Of yeah, that's, you know, sex tech is huge now. So right. the sex tech industry, being able to find different toys that are going to work for you, that are going to mm -hmm. give you pleasure, um, you know, having um, a friend to talk to sometimes, yes. a virtual yes. friend, those things. Um, I think is very important. So being able to talk about that in the book, I think will definitely be um, a benefit to, to right, couples exactly. and just to give them some skills on how to communicate with each other. Because I find that when couples come in, there's this, such this big barrier and rupture that's happened. And so what I really want to do is be able to give them the tools just to get to a place where they can um, be comfortable with themselves, be comfortable in their body. Because as you know, sexuality in a relationship, it involves just such a wide mix of feelings. Right, definitely. Mm -hmm. And having to adjust to that. Yes, yeah. And it's many times um, in working with um, sexuality and with couples, helping them to communicate um, also helps them outside of the bedroom in communicating. Absolutely, yeah. Like it's just, you know, it's, you know, yes, it, we're learning sexual communication, but sexual communication can, can help benefit people outside of things. You know, what's interesting is that we're seeing how kink and BDSM okay. can help people that don't practice it because in the kink and BDSM culture, there is this, you know, heavy dose of communication that has to happen during a play scene. And right. so other couples can learn that on the other side of the fence, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So that's fascinating to me. And people are using BDSM play um, to really focus on their good pain versus their bad pain. The bad, yeah, the, chron the chronic pain that they have, they're right, able to right. distract it by pleasure 
by doing, inflicting the good pain, the good sensations that make okay. it good to them. Right. And that's being a dom or being a sub. Right. So I find that to be very interesting. That's starting to come up in the research now. Okay, good, good, good. And I would think even as I'm, I'm thinking about this, um, if you're always the caretaker, <laughs> yeah, and then if you do this play where you can be the um, submissive, it helps the person who is, um, has this chronic illness feel a little power. Absolutely. It yeah. takes them out. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Because you know what's interesting is that a lot of times I have people that come into therapy that are interested in BDSM. And right. I find that the person that wants to be a sub, they may be a big executive at a company. Right, exactly. Yes. <laughs> They're yes, used to yes. being the boss all day, right? And right, then, right. So they want to, yeah. They yeah. want the reversal, yes. Yeah, and then the person that is the subordinate at an organization, they want to feel what it's like to be a dom. Right. So I love that idea about the caregiver, maybe switching things up a little bit and maybe mm -hmm. taking on a submissive role. Right, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Great. And also, I even think when you um, add play into it, it takes away that, like you said, it doesn't have to be the focus of orgasm, orgasm, orgasm. Exactly. You play, yes. yes. Yes, where there's more of like a pleasure component to it. And then couples, right. couples can realize that because couples that come in without chronic pain conditions or chronic illness and then couples that come in where they don't have that, they still feel like everything has to be a performance. Right. A lot of times. And I think getting them to a place where they can understand that, hey, it's, it's what you want to make of it. I always tell people you have a sexual tasting menu. You exactly. have an appetizer, you have an entree, and you have a dessert. Right. And right. that entree, <laughs> and the, and, and the appetizer can be cuddling, kissing, touching. Right. Your entree does not have to be penetration. It can be more touching. It can be mm -hmm. oral sex. And then, of course, your dessert is your reflection. That right. can be cuddling. You can talk about how it felt for you. How did you like it? Did you like it when I touched you this way, when I kissed you that way? Um, again, so I like to use that in my sessions as well. I find that to be very helpful. And then the couples, you know, or person, they can go home and they can try that. And then of course, come back in and report on how it went. Right, right. Definitely. And all that is, is helping them communicate. And the more you communicate, the more closer and intimate you feel and the bond it's yeah, because, you know, when your life does get restricted by disability, I think it can, in the, especially in the beginning stages, you know, it consumes you so much to where you're not able to think about everything else, right? Everything is on the illness. And so the goal is to, once you're learning to live well with it, it's time to branch out and try something different, try something new. And that's what makes it exciting. Good. Yes. Awesome. Yes. Yes. And so um, we're going to take a little break, but in our break, I would like you to talk, tell us more about what you do. And I think you um, participated, you have your own podcast. So yes, take it away. Yeah. So one of the things that, um, that I do on the side is that, you know, I write, I'm a blogger, I, I blog on my website, I do all of that. And what I am now is I am a guest. I am the um, I am the sex therapist on Invisible Not Broken, which is a chronic illness podcast. So once a month, I get on there and we talk about various topics. And one of the things that I'm going to be talking about um, this month or next month in February is exploring sexual pleasure, communication, and freedom. Um, for gender minorities with chronic pain, illness, and disability. So shifting the gears and um, talking about that on people that are transgendered with disabilities, people that are non-binary, uh, people that are LGBT, LGBT clients, um, consensual non-monogamy, polyamorous clients, because you know when you're coming out as an LGBT pers LGBTQ person, then you're having to come out with a chronic illness. Right. And that can, that can be very, very difficult. So that's what I'm focusing on now. Okay. And I'm going to be speaking at ASECT this year in Palm, oh. in Palm Springs on that topic, which I'm really excited about because yeah. I think we need more talks on sexuality and disability. And I think that's really gonna help a lot of folks out too. There's a lot of research I've been doing on that. So I'm busy with that right now. and. 
yeah, I'm always writing and blogging about about the topic, which which I which I love. Um, that's my big specialty now. Okay, and so how can people find you? Um, if people want to find me, they can reach me um, on Instagram at Dr. Lee Phillips. I am also on Facebook at Dr. Lee Phillips. And you can also uh, reach me uh, via my website, which is www.drleephillips.com. Okay, awesome. <laughs> All right, thank you. So now we're in the last part of our um, segment here, which is our toolbox. Mm -hmm. Yes, so do you have any particular tools for um, people in, in chronic illness or chronic disability or mm -hmm. Um, to help them and then if you have a tool or two to help their partner yeah one of the tools that I recommend and it's very easy I think when people are so busy they are not listening to their bodies so one of the one of the um, tools that I give my clients with chronic pain is something called pacing for pain so an example of pacing for pain so an example of that would be say because with chronic pain it's full of uncertainty. You may wake up one day feeling amazing, and then the next day you wake up and you feel like, I don't know, a Mack truck hit you. Okay. So it's really listening to your body and doing a self-inventory of where your pain is at. And so by taking that self-inventory, taking one task at a time during the day. Because when people experience chronic pain and they're feeling so great, they may clean the entire house, they may mm -hmm. go run all these errands, they wear themselves out, and then the next day, yep, and then they crash and their energy's down and they may be in bed for days. Right. And so it's really listening to your body. I think that's critical. And okay. one way to do that is doing a body scan every day, like from your head to your toes. Where do you feel the tension at? And really taking that into account. Because if you don't, you run that risk of wearing yourself out. Um, and what I do with my couples as, um, you know, with a partner that may be healthy is have them do the body scan with them. Do it as an activity together. Okay. Um, do different meditations together. By doing that, it can bring you closer together. I think right. that's important. Um, that's one great tool. The other thing that I find that is really critical, and this goes back into communication about intimacy and sex, is being able to really just invite your partner into each other's world. I think mirroring is very great where you you say something and your partner just repeats it right back just to understand and ask hey did I get that right do right. I understand where you're coming from and so being able to do that in the session but then being able to do that outside of the session I think is important to give them um, communication tools the other thing that I find that's critical is where on your body do you feel pleasure where is that now if something's changed is there a place that you love and where is that? So giving them some exercises for mindful touching, I find to be very helpful for individuals, but also for couples. I think they're both critical um, to be able to do that, to find you know, what brings you pleasure. Um, and then of course, looking at um, what's the, the time of day to do this. I have couples that come in and it's like their peak hours are off. Someone may be more sexual in the morning, someone being more sexual in the afternoon and in the evening. So we look at adjusting. Adjusting. So can that healthy partner go into sexual adjustment where they do something maybe in the morning mm -hmm. and, and try in different toys, you know, and they come back in and they report and they really, they really like it. Um, I have to say there is a new toy that's out there that I absolutely love for men. It's called the guy braider and it's where okay. you, you actually, you, it's, it's like a cup, uh, type of thing and you stick your penis in and it's got different vibrations okay. and it's really great for the for the for the male partner or someone who identifies with having a penis you know right. there's different things to get creative with right okay good yeah awesome. I'll tell you I always tell my clients you know you you got to get curious about your partner and get creative with creative yourself get curious about your partner and creative with yourself awesome I know we talked a little bit, and I, and I know when you were saying adjusting the time was when we were talking a little bit about energy. Yes. Because a lot of this, I mean, we talked about pain, but a lot of this, again, um, and I just want to make sure we focus a little bit on energy. It's about energy. And um, I mean, believe we only have so much energy in a day. Yes, we do. We do. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and everyone feels their energy 
energy different. And so I think it's important to identify where do you put that energy? Right. Where right. does that energy go? Yeah. Right. And how to um, save it when you, um, because to be intimate many times requires some kind of energy. Yes. Absolutely. And is that in the evening? Some people wake up more in the evening. Is it, is it in the morning? You know, right. I mean, I will tell you most of my, my clients with chronic pain and chronic illness, they're more sexual in the mornings. Okay. That's where their, their energy level is usually at because, um, if they've gotten a good night's rest. Now, unfortunately, some people that have chronic pain or chronic illness conditions, they have a difficult time sleeping. So everyone's gonna be different, but I think if you can do something with the energy levels and find out where can you be sexual and what's the frequency going to be like. Right, right, definitely. Good, 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 good. And, and also planning sex, putting it on the agenda. Oh, yes, yes, yeah. <laughs> Yes, and I would think that's very important for all of us, but also if you have a chronic illness. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm, to even prepare your body for it and that kind of stuff. Yes, so it's not a, a shock. It's not a shock. And, and feelings aren't hurt and that kind of thing. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's very important. So we talk about all that, but we really get into that like after acceptance. You know, a lot of times mm -hmm. we can't even get there until they've accepted where they're at and where they really want to go. But that's, but I will tell you that I have a lot of people that come in and they're, they're ready for that. They've accepted it. The illness is a part of them now, the pain's there, but now they want to have better sex or they want to just have some type of sex life. Right. And I've seen it where um, a chronic illness has happened and people think it's going to destroy their relationship, but actually it's made them closer because of all the things that you just said. Wow. You hit the nail on the head with that one because... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's yes, so true. It can bring, far. yes, it can bring people so close because they're having to work together now. Right. And you right. also want to, you also want to look at what was the sex life prior to an illness? Oh, exactly. We haven't <laughs> talked about that. Yes. yes. <laughs> That's a whole other show. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but those are important questions to, to think about and to look at before someone, you know, when they're coming in, you know, I mean, did they have a vibrant sex life and has this really... Do they feel like this has really destroyed them as a couple or has it made it worse because there was no sex prior to an onset of a disability, right. you know? So really trying to focus in on that. Right. And one of the things that it's really good for when you, when you have a chronic illness and you're still intimate, because if you're not still intimate and it's just the illness, 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 it takes um, the caretaker maybe not feel like, hey, this is my partner. I'm just caretaking yes there's that yes. disconnect that's where i say yes. that rupture starts because they take on a caregiver role right and the intimacy it completely goes to the wayside so we really try to focus on how can we shift that and how can we um and a lot of that you know that's why you know we use a you know in the deep rooted in sex therapy we always use cognitive therapy and sometimes i think that really comes into to play is being able to mm -hmm. look at your thought process and be able to shift that um, and to be able to behave in a different manner if you can do that. I think that's important too. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes, definitely. Well, Dr. Um, Phillips, you have just brought us so much information uh, about um, chronic illness and intimacy. And as we've been talking and as he's been sharing with us, we're just not talking about just physical intimate, physical sex. He's brought in and talked about a lot of different types of intimacy and using toys, um, other ways, just kissing, hugging, different um, atmosphere, you know, adding different things, whether it's adding another person in, but there's ways for pleasure. So if you're having a chronic illness, don't think, hey, my gosh, my life is going to stop. I'm not going to have any other pleasure. There's many ways. Yes, yeah. yes, yes, definitely. And so if people want to... Find Dr. Lee Phillips. You said on Facebook and Instagram. Yeah, you can find me there on um, uh, at Dr. Lee Phillips, and then also you can visit my website, which is www.drleephillips.com. Okay. Yes. Do you do um, video sessions? I don't at the time, but okay. I am planning on doing that in the future. Absolutely. <laughs> that that's on the that's on the list of things that I will be tackling here in the near future. Okay, definitely. And if you're in DC, definitely go check him out. And you have a um, new book coming out. And when will this book be coming out? 
Um, I'm hoping that the proposal will be finished um, here in the next uh, month or two, and then I will be working on it after that, and I'm hoping it will be out by the end of 2020 or 2021 at the latest. Okay, all right. And so you guys look out, it's called Sex and Love When You Are Sick. And um, he's on a podcast called Invisible Not Broken, which is on, I'm assuming, iTunes and Yes, iTunes and all of that. Yep, it's there. And all of that. Okay, yes. Thank you so much for being on the show. We thank you. It. You're always welcome back. And thanks again. And this is the Bringing Intimacy Back show. Thank you.